morning. Good morning. This is Russ. <laughs> and Kitty. Weldon with Father's Heart <laughs> Ministry. This is the Morning Light Daily Bible Study where we go through the Bible chapter by chapter. Get our whole Bible and back. Get our whole Bible back. We love it. Today we're on Genesis 45. And the title of this study is Jesus is our Joseph. Now why do we say that? Because 1 Corinthians 10, 11 says that the things that are recorded in the Old Testament are there as an example, as a message from God to us in the narrative on whom the ends of the age have come. Mm -hmm. So we have to read this. If you just read this as history, it's not going to help you. Right. You have to read this and say, what is God saying to me about who Jesus is to us mm -hmm. from this chapter? So Genesis 45 Jesus is our Joseph. In this chapter, Joseph admits, reveals himself to his brothers, and he doesn't hold them any ill will, even though they betrayed him, because he sees that all of the events that brought him to Egypt were orchestrated by God to the salvation Amen. of his family. Amen. So Kitty, why don't you begin and just read the entire chapter, Genesis 45. Okay, verse 1. And Joseph could not refrain himself before all of them that stood by him, and he cried, Cause every man to go out from me. And there stood no man with him, while Joseph made himself known to his brothers. And he wept aloud, and the Egyptians and the house of Pharaoh heard. And Joseph said unto his brethren, I am Joseph. Doth my father yet live? And his brothers could not answer him, for they were troubled at his presence. And Joseph said unto his brethren, Come near to me, I pray you. And they came near. And he said, I am Joseph, your brother whom you sold into Egypt. Now therefore be not grieved nor angry with yourselves that you sold me hither. For God did send me before you to preserve life. For these two years hath famine been in the uh, land, and yet there are five years, in the which there shall neither be earring, that's the corn, nor harvest. Now don't you know... What Joseph is saying is, you guys threw me in a pit, sold me into slavery, told my father I was dead. But it was all orchestrated by God to save this family. Hmm. What a message that Judas should have heard. Wow. Instead of uh, committing suicide, if he could have heard this. Why did Judas commit suicide? He was angry with himself. Yep. He tried to make something happen. He tried to compel Jesus to do something that he wasn't going to do. Mm -hmm. And as a result, when Judas saw Jesus allowed himself to die, then he realized what a terrible thing he had done. What if he could have pondered this message right here? Don't mm -hmm. be angry with yourself, Judas. This was all orchestrated by God. Because the betrayal of these brothers to Joseph is just as pronounced as the betrayal of Judas regarding Jesus, other, of course, than the fact of Jesus being the Son of God. Right. So, but remember, Joseph is a pattern of Christ. Mm -hmm. Joseph, we see in Joseph a shadow of things to come. So, and um, the, the facts, too, are that he didn't just save his family, he saved Egypt and all the lands surrounding because he knew the dream and he knew to store food. Absolutely. I mean, he was very influential. So it's just like Jesus came to save the whole world. But those will come to him. So verse uh, 7, And God sent me before you to preserve you a posterity in the earth and to save your lives by great deliverance. So it, it was not you that sent me hither, but God. And he hath made me father to Pharaoh and lord of all his house and ruler throughout the land of Egypt. So we know that Pharaoh was young. Yeah. And it's, it's very true in those, in antiquity, back in those days, uh, many times very young children came to power. And so mm -hmm. here Joseph was 30 years old and Pharaoh looked at him as a papa. Mm. Haste ye, go up to my father, and say to him, Thus saith thy son Joseph, God hath made me lord over of all Egypt. Come down unto me, and tarry not. And thou shalt dwell in the land of Goshen, and thou shalt be near unto me, thou and thy children, and thy children's children's children, thy children's children, <laughs> and thy flocks and herds, and all that thou hast. And there I will nourish thee, for yet there are five years of famine, lest thou and thy household and all that thou hast come to poverty. And behold, your eyes see, and your, the eyes of my brother 
your eyes see, and the eyes of my brother Benjamin, that it is my mouth that speaketh to you. In other words, what he's saying is, look at the family resemblance. Yeah. He's telling them, look at Benjamin and look at me. Can't you see the family resemblance? Sure enough. Um, and you shall tell my father of all my glory in Egypt and of all that you've seen, and you shall haste to bring down my father hither. And he fell upon his brother Benjamin's neck and wept, and, we and Benjamin wept upon his neck. Moreover, he kissed all of his brethren and wept on upon them. And after that, his brethren talked with him. Now they're going to talk to him. Well, they're starting to believe. Reality check. <laughs> and the fame thereof was heard in Pharaoh's house, saying, Joseph's brethren are come. And it pleased Pharaoh well and his servants. And Pharaoh said unto Joseph, Say unto thy brethren, This do ye, laid your beasts, and go and get you into the land of Canaan, and take your father and your households, and come up unto me, and I will give you the good land of Egypt, and you shall eat the fat of the land. Sounds like something the father said. Now uh, now thou art commanded to do, do this, do you this. Take your wagons out of the land of Egypt for your little ones and your wives, and bring your father and come. Also regard not your stuff for the good of all the land of Egypt is yours. Just leave everything wow. behind. Don't pack. Don't pack. <laughs> and the children of Israel did so, and Joseph gave them wagons according to the commandment of Pharaoh. Excuse me, I have a little hiccup here. According... Verse 22. Thank you. The commandment of Pharaoh. Um... To he gave them changes, mm -hmm. yes. To all of them he gave each man changes of raiment, but to Benjamin he gave 300 pieces of silver and five changes of raiment. And that was his natural brother. And to his father he sent after this manner, 10 asses laden with good, good things of Egypt and 10 she asses laden with corn and bread and meat for his father by the way. So he sent his brethren away and they departed and he said to them, see that you fail you fall not out by the way. And they went up out of Egypt, and they came to the land of Canaan unto Jacob their father, and told them, saying, Joseph is yet alive, and he is governor over all the land of Egypt. And Jacob's heart was fainted, for he believed them not. And they told him all the words of Joseph, which he had said unto them. And when he saw the wagons which Joseph had carried to him, the spirit of Jacob and their father revived. And Israel said, It is enough. Joseph, my son, is yet alive. I will go and see him before I die. And he lived after he got to Egypt another 17 years. Yeah, I read that. <clears throat> so this chapter of Genesis conveys the account of Joseph revealing himself to his brothers. Mm -hmm. The occasion of Joseph being so moved, if you look back on the chapter before, remember Judah came and had a private conversation. He said, let me, let me talk to you privately. And he was so moved at the compassion of Judah, willing to sell himself into slavery for Simeon and for Benjamin. Uh, Judah's interceding. He's offering and saying, if I don't go back with Benjamin to my father, and he would rather be a slave in Egypt than to return home to Jacob without Benjamin. It's a perfect picture in Judah of Jesus interceding before the Father for sin-sick humanity. Mm -hmm. Jesus offered to take on our punishment. Judah is offering to take on punishment rather than to return. And in Jesus' case, he doesn't want to go back to heaven without captivity, uh, captive humanity being set free from sin to be mm -hmm. in the kingdom. And it's sin that we're dealing with. It's the sin of these brothers against Joseph mm -hmm. that is... Uh, at issue here. And Joseph, then through the entire interaction in all these chapters, he's dealing to mitigate that by his own compassion. Mm -hmm. The righteousness of these brothers stood in the compassion of Joseph. Mm -hmm. We're not righteous because of anything we've done no. or anything we can do. <clears throat> Our righteousness is in the loving kindness of Jesus mm -hmm. being willing to pay the price for us and our confidence in that loving mm -hmm. kindness to uproot our lives and to come to Jesus as these brothers are being compelled to come to Joseph. Amen. In verse 1, Joseph can't contain himself. And he orders all the Egyptians out of the room 
that they might not witness as he pours out his heart to his brethren. And, and notice, this is also a picture, Joseph telling all the Egyptians to get out. This is a picture of the compassion of Christ for us, bought by his own suffering. Egypt is a type of the world, and the world has no part and no place in the work of redemption, either as a witness or as a partaker. There is a place of intimacy, and we don't get this in the church today. We just want to include everybody, just come on in and just partake of all of these things. There was a king, I believe it was Hezekiah, got in trouble for doing that. He took the king of Babylon and showed him all the treasures of the temple, even in the Holy of Holies, and the prophet chastised him. What have you done? There is a place of intimacy with God, mm -hmm. and there's a place of intimacy in the indwelling of the Holy Spirit that people out there in the world, you have to say to them, get out. Mm -hmm. This is not for you. Just as Joseph told the Egyptians, you get out. But it noticed that they heard. Yeah. They didn't see it, but they heard it. Heard a sound. And that what they heard is for us the hearing of the gospel. Mm -hmm. Sounds like good news to me. Yeah. And when they found out what was going on, all the Egyptians were rejoicing. Do you see how it's a picture of the gospel transaction? Sure, But the, mis news. the mistake that the church makes today is, oh no, you just come on in. We're just gonna show, we're gonna give all this to you. We tell people they can become born again without repenting. They'll go to heaven whether they mm -hmm. give their life to Jesus or not. It couldn't be more wrong. Mm -hmm. And it, that is, mm -hmm. That is revealed, it's conveyed in type and shadow in the chapter that we're studying. Mm -hmm. So even though Joseph clears the room, his weeping before his brothers is heard. Nonetheless, he makes it known, he makes himself known who he is, and he asks if his father does in fact live. And the brothers are just speechless before Joseph. The brothers are unable to grasp what is actually <laughs> taking place right before their eyes. And isn't that the struggle of the believer? Uh, Joseph is a type of Jesus, our big brother. And we have such a hard time. We should go our entire life struggling to believe the implications of the cross, mm -hmm. the love that sent Jesus to the cross. And Joseph is trying to convince them as Jesus, by the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, by the word of the gospel, is trying to convince us. And uh, so the brothers are struggling and he says, hey, come, come near to me. And uh, he's saying plainly, I am Joseph, your brother. I am the brother you sold into Egypt. And again, this just speaks eloquently as a type and shadow of Jesus himself calling the skeptical and the unbelieving to him, mm -hmm. declaring that he is our brother, sold into the sufferings of the cross for your sake. And for mine, when you struggle to believe God, the answer is not to go buy the top 10 books on the Christian book sellers list. The answer is, if you could ask Jesus, Jesus, I'm struggling so much mm -hmm. to have everything that your word promised. What do I have to do? He says to you what Joseph said to his brothers, come near to me. Mm -hmm. The answer is not learning some convoluted approach to God that if you pray just right, or if you do these things, or you attend this conference, or you think like this, or have this viewpoint, all of this religious foolishness. Now, the answer to Believing and receiving everything Joseph had to give those brothers, he said, come near to me. Mm -hmm. You're not getting it. Come closer to me. Mm -hmm. When you, Jesus is our Joseph, when you come closer to him, guess what? Your heart will be believing when you see how much he loves you mm -hmm. and what he's done for you, then you'll believe and then you will receive. Mm -hmm. So Joseph's heart and by extension, the heart of Jesus is not that his brothers grieve or be angry with themselves. God doesn't want you to grieve. God doesn't want you to be angry with yourself. That doesn't mean that betraying Joseph was okay because it wasn't. Right. That doesn't mean that sin in our lives is okay. Uh, but rather, he wants us to see that, just as Joseph wanted his brothers to see, that his epic suffering at their hands was for the purpose of preserving their lives mm -hmm. in a time of famine, just like Jesus wants to preserve you. Amen. See, we can see in all of this the true heart of Christ. 
Jesus doesn't want to fill you with a religious sense of mourning. Mourning or contrition does not move the heart of Jesus, for that is ultimately not what he wants. What Joseph wants to see and what Jesus wants to see in us is that his brothers believe, that we believe in who he is and we believe in what he's done. What Joseph did for his brothers, what Jesus has done for us. And he wants us to see, and Joseph wanted his brothers to see, that the betrayal of the past was all a part of the work of redemption. See, Jesus doesn't want our crocodile tears of religious expression but that we, as in the case of Joseph, would believe in who Jesus is as our Lord and Savior, mm -hmm. and that we believe that he is willing and in fact has done for each and every one of us in going to the cross for our sake, providing for our salvation. He's not only bringing us salvation from a temporal loss, as in the case of of the brothers, Joseph's brothers. He was just mm -hmm. saving them from being hungry. Mm -hmm. uh, that's just a temporal loss. But Jesus saved us from eternal damnation. Amen. Joseph compels his brothers in verse 7 to understand that in their act of betrayal, God was bringing about his plan on a deeper level to save and to deliver the whole family. From this perspective, Joseph declares, verse 8, that it was God that sent him to Egypt, mm -hmm. not to suffer alone, but to be made a father to Pharaoh. That's what God wants you to be as an ambassador of Christ. Mm -hmm. He was God's representative. God wants you to be a father to those out there who don't know who Jesus is, who aren't in the kingdom of God. Mm -hmm. In light of this, verse 9, Joseph compels them, the brothers. He said, I want you to make haste and bring the entire family to the safety of Joseph's care. Just as in the light of the work of salvation, Jesus wants us to make haste and bring our family in yeah. and bring our loved ones. This is the heart of evangelism right yeah, here. Right there. Because you are saved, hey, make haste. Mm -hmm. And go sit in church and look at the back of somebody else's head. Mm -hmm. No, make haste. Bring your family in to this mm -hmm. work of salvation. Mm -hmm. He wants us to make haste that we and our loved ones might enjoy the safety and the nurture yes. of all those who accept him will enjoy, not only in this life, but in the life to come. Amen. Now, while staying in Egypt, Joseph's family will live in the land of Goshen. In order to be near to Joseph, that all the children and the flocks might dwell together. Now, Goshen means drawing near. I like this. Come dwell in the land of drawing near <laughs> to Joseph, who is our Jesus. How, what's the key to believing? Come near to me. You're not believing me. Come here. Come here. Come close to me. Then you'll believe. And then not only come close to him. Yes, I was close to the Lord once. No, he doesn't want you just to visit closeness. He says, I want you now. I want you to live in the land of drawing near. Amen. I want that to be the geography where your walk with God gets lived out. That's part of uh, Solomon, Song of Solomon. Let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth. For his love, love is better is, than wine. Yes, his love is so rich. Draw me and I will run after thee. <laughs> see, we see just as Joseph wanted his brothers to come near so they would believe, and he wanted to live in a territory whose name meant drawing near, this is a type of Christ. Mm -hmm. In coming to Christ, God wants us to dwell. He wants you to dwell in the land of drawing near to him. Mm -hmm. More than any other dominating thought that you might have about what it means to be a Christian. What does it mean to be a Christian? It means I'm drawing near to him. This was precisely the message of Jesus when he called the 12 in Mark 3.14. It was a really powerful scripture. It said he ordained the 12 that they should be with him that he might send them forth. Yeah. If they never would have come near to Joseph, he couldn't have sent them forth because they would have left not believing. Mm -hmm. And they would have went back and died of starvation in Canaan. Wow. They had to draw near. And until the drawing near took place, they didn't have anything to say to their dad mm -hmm. when they went back to Canaan. Mm -hmm. They had to draw near that they might believe. And just as Jesus, listen, 
Are you ordained of God? Amen. He has ordained you, Mark 3, 14, that you should be with him. And I love it. In the second part, that he might send them forth. If you haven't been with him, he can't send you forth. Amen. You show me somebody preaching and out there implementing their ministry and they have no intimacy. They have not drawn near until unbelief is expunged from their life and their thinking. Mm. Not, they're not qualified. Here's what qualifies you to fulfill the Great Commission. It's the quality of your drawing near. Mm -hmm. Are you living in the land of drawing near to him? Mm -hmm. Everything else is religious foolishness and you may safely jettison it. <laughs> so what do you think you are called to? Most of all, what is the high calling on your life? It's more than preaching. It's more than going to the mission field. It's more than any other thing that you might think you are called to. You are foremost and above all, called to the spiritual land of Goshen, to the place of drawing near. By the call of Jesus, Mark 3, 14, you are ordained to be with him. Any other idea, any other plan that you might have is worthless and not of God if this is not your first and your highest response to the work of Calvary in your behalf. Joseph goes on and he promises, I like this, to nourish the family for what he knows by revelation. He says there's five more years of famine in order to keep them from coming to poverty. He's going to nourish them so that they don't come to poverty. Amen. You see that? <laughs> Hallelujah. Yeah. Jesus Finally. is our Joseph. He's our He's prosperity. He's nourishing you. And, and that nourishment will manifest itself when it's evident you are not coming to poverty. Amen. Are you poor? You need some nourishment that can Jesus. only come from Jesus. Amen. Do you see how this reveals the heart of Jesus? Mm -hmm. Joseph is saying in verse 11, I will nourish you lest you come to poverty. Where do people get the idea that poverty is ever in the plan of God for their lives? That's blasphemy. Mm -hmm. Amen. That is blasphemy against the heart of God. Paul declared that Jesus, as our Joseph, has no desire for us to suffer lack. Look at 2 Corinthians 8, 9. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. When it mentions grace, it's talking about the work of redemption. Mm -hmm. That though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, just as Joseph became poor in the prison, that the, his brothers through Joseph's poverty could be made rich. Jesus became poor so that you might be rich. And he's not talking about spiritual riches here. If you study mm -hmm. the context of that 2 Corinthians chapter 8, mm -hmm. he's talking about M-O-N-E-Y. Mm -hmm. Wealth, riches, fullness that God wants you to have. He wants you to draw near to him that he may nourish you. There is nourishment you're only going to get when you come near to him. Mm -hmm. And when you come near to him, you're going to find some nourishment that will keep you from coming to poverty. Amen. And if you're in poverty, it'll bring you out of poverty. He is the bread of life. And then he says, make haste. Hey, go get the rest of the family. Hmm. <laughs> go get, there's the heart of evangelism. When you get this, evangelism is not going to be a problem. Amen. And then he just, Joseph stops and he just turns and falls on Benjamin's neck and weeps openly. Why? Because he's not in love with the plan. He's in love with us. Mm -hmm. For him, for Joseph and for Jesus as our Joseph, he just wanted to wrap his arms around his brother. And he wept. And then he went to every one of those brothers that betrayed him. And he fell on their necks and he just cried. Can, mm -hmm. can you imagine? I like... Hebrews 2.11, talking about Jesus as our Joseph, said, He that sanctified and they who are sanctified are all of one, for which cause he, Jesus, is not ashamed to call us brothers. Amen. He's not ashamed of you. He just wants to fall on your neck and wrap his arms around you and just sob, not mm -hmm. because he's sad, but because he loves you so much. Amen. And there is you, nourishment Jesus. in the nearness. Are yes, that's good. And that nourishment, above other things, along with other things, will keep you from being poor. Mm -hmm. 
So the events taking place here are made known to Pharaoh, and he adds his command to the urging of Joseph for them to return and to retrieve their father Jacob and the balance of their households and come back again to Egypt. Now Pharaoh wants them to come to Egypt. Can you imagine God moving so much that even people out there that don't even know God want you to obey God? <laughs> Just go ahead and obey. He wants them to come. And uh, so they return to Canaan. They inform Jacob of everything that's taking place. And of all the good news regarding salvation from the famine, Jacob is primarily interested in one thing. Uh, he said, it's enough. It's enough. So, okay, I get it. <laughs> we don't have to worry about the famine, but all that really matters to me is my son J Joseph yet lives. And Amen. that he gets to see him before he dies. And he got to spend 17 years with Joseph after that. Now, mm -hmm. what do we learn from this chapter? The whole of the narrative of Joseph. Now, I know many of you have never heard it taught like this. If you've never heard it taught like this, I want you to email us at russellwalden at gmail.com. That's R-U-S-S-E-L-L-W-A-L-D-E-N at gmail.com. If you've never heard it taught like this, we want to hear from you. We want to hear it. Has this blessed you? Has this touched your life? This whole narrative is a picture of Jesus what Joseph was to them, Jesus is to us, our brother, suffering in our behalf that we might be saved from sin and receive forgiveness, that Joseph's brothers might be saved from famine and receive forgiveness because they were standing there blood guilty just as we have been born in sin. Right. And as a consequence of our own transgression, we need a Savior just mm -hmm. like they needed a Savior. And mm -hmm. Joseph was abundantly willing to extend to them the clemency of his love. And even so, Jesus is abundantly willing. Mm -hmm. and, but look at everything Joseph is dealing with here, just as Jesus deals with us. He's got to overcome our unbelief. Yes. Unbelief that is a manifestation of a lack of nearness to him because he says, come near. If you come near, you are nourished with the uh, authenticity of his love. And you're going to believe him for anything you have need of. Amen. Why don't you pray? Father, thank you for our lesson today. This is such a precious chapter of your life, Jesus, to us, poured out for us. And we're asking for the drawing power of the Holy Spirit to draw us closer. We can't get close enough. I know it's true in our relationship. Russ and I just can't get enough of each other. We just so want to be touching, holding all the time because we are so in love. Let that be carried over into our walk with you, our life with you, and cause others to inquire of the hope that we have within us. That, that is Jesus. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.